Happy days. Uh, traffic engineering measures that solicit positive public comment. Uh, this is our agenda. Um, I'm not going to insult you by reading it. We're just going to go through it, so we'll keep going. What is positive public comment? Positive public comment is just what it sounds like. The public reacting positive to a treatment that we've designed and installed. Our data on these positive comments are more ses set, excuse me, sessions experience with the public and less hard numbers. We've had positive responses from uh, private citizens, law enforcement, and other governmental agencies. These comments come in many forms, such as calls, emails, and maybe even one little red and white postcard that you taped to your office door for six months hoping someone would read it. <laughs> However, we're not just going to focus on the positive. Um, I get to play bad cop here. So we're also going to uh, talk about these measures effectiveness of an overall traffic outlook and their implementation costs and challenges. Each of these measures that we show you, although are going to generate positive comments, uh, need to be implemented responsibly. They need to comply to the latest TMUT CD and the latest, you know, other applicable manuals, guidelines, standards. Don't just go around installing these things like some sort of crazy traffic Johnny Appleseed. Pavement marking shields, uh, please note them on the ground and also note the signs up ahead. Uh, on the first sign, two arrows are going right. The second sign, one arrow is going to the right and the other one's going to the left, which for us isn't a problem, but for the unfamiliar driver, it might cause issue. Uh, pavement marking shields are typically uh, used at freeway to freeway interchanges and direct connectors uh, where there's abundance of signing. Uh, this allows drivers to focus longer on the road. They're popular because they give the drivers a way to recognize the lane that they need to be in. It's helpful in areas that have abundant weaving. Uh, they supplement sometimes confusing overhead signs, uh, such as the signs are placed in a curve where initially it doesn't look like the sign lines up with the lane that you're supposed to be in, or if there's another area where another lane opens up, uh, now you know which lane it is that you're supposed to go to. They also narrow the driver's focus and kind of reduce sign clutter for some folks. And they also allow drivers another option to look at when they're behind a very large vehicle that may include the large signs up there. It acts like a picture can be instantly recognized. We've got a few pictures here. There's a couple of them, 6, 10, 45. If you notice, they're very large. They're right in the middle of the lane. Um, well, right occupying the whole lane. Here are the Houston District Standards. If you notice, well, you probably can't notice it. Uh, about 15 feet by 8 feet, um, sometimes larger. Very few times smaller. A little example of them here, if you notice on the left side, you have, we're starting to enter. Okay, it's going to tell you, this. you're in this lane. You're, you're going 45, 45, 45. Hey, you're going to exit either the Beltway or the toll road. And if you want to get to the airport, if you notice, uh, we just continue on down the road, we drop. We have a lane added, an auxiliary lane. We put the shield down. This one intersection going towards uh, Bush Intercontinental, we have had all sorts of people miss getting to Bush Intercontinental. We put down these shields. We had a large diagrammatic sign. Put down these shields, no problems. Um, and again, we'll just go to that one and another picture here. Now, pavement marks and shields. Freeway to freeway interchanges. But that means we have to close freeway to freeway interchanges to put these things down or to maintain them. These are nighttime closures in metro or urban districts. They're expensive closures. Um, that's, that's something you want to think about. Um, they are installed in locations of unusually high traffic with unusually high weaving. That means they get worn out unusually quick. So. Think about that when you're putting them down as people call and say, hey, I'd like it here at this exit. Well, wait a minute. Um, it also leads that there's no, it leads me into how they're put down. They're best if they're installed on pristine pavement, not driven on pavement, their first installation, or they require complicated surface prep. 
and you really want that surface prep done right the first time because the shields themselves are very expensive, 500 per. That's just the shield, not the words, just the shield. Now, when you are replacing the shield, it's a thousand. Don't know why, but it is. So, um, <laughs> well, we got to get the old one up, and then. So that's not traffic control. That's not nothing else. That's just the shields. So. We'll move on to truck lane restrictions. Note our friendly orange compliant truck driver. Truck lane signs are perceived as a way to allow cars to uh, freely maneuver. Uh, it gets them away from that big truck that has slow acceleration and deceleration. They are installed at control access freeways with three or more lanes and a six or longer mile stretch in urbanized areas. Typically, there's more guidelines found in the Texas Transportation Code. Truck lane signs are appreciated by drivers, trucking companies, and truck drivers to lessen vehicle conflicts. Everyone's happy. Everyone's happy. That never happens, which makes our happy day. Um, and they also, oops, did I go too far? No, no, you're good. No? Oh, okay. They're appreciated by both cities and counties as a way to show the public they're proactive to the concerns of drivers. So when you get that concerned call, why yes, yes, we are doing something about it. Let me tell you. A few pictures here. This is the one of the first types that we put down in the Houston district. We started on I-10 East. Um, we went down to 225, and in the beginning, we were doing timed lane restrictions, and it was during the peak hours from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. We really realized it was from 12 a.m. to 11:59:59. Um, so we went ahead and switched it to a 24-hour. You know, thank you, legislature, and. You notice 20 miles, and then, of course, Dallas had to come in and beat us. They put a 40 mile, 41 mile up. Truck lane restrictions, everybody loves them. Everybody. However, they are not a truck-free lane, truck-free zone, where drivers can just be in there, just car drivers and no trucks at all. Trucks are allowed to use that lane to pass. They're allowed to use that lane to get left exits. They're allowed to go around. Um, crashes, construction, all this. However, as I call them, the justified or the, um, the entitled driver does not believe that is true and will call and complain while praising them. Now, they must be installed on the controlled access freeway, six or more miles, three plus lanes. However, other um, criteria should be considered when putting them in. Um, they can't be installed by public demand uh, they're not installed by petition. There are rules, there are regs, and you want to follow those rules and regulations in installing them because they're only enforceable when law enforcement. They're only, they're only going to work when law enforcement enforces them. And part of why I say you want to pay attention to where they're put in is if the law enforcement officers are not able to pull trucks over to enforce those lane restrictions, they then become useless. It's just a bunch of signs and people then start complaining that the trucks are ignoring the uh, restriction. Uh, and when they're used improperly um, or if they're put on non, uh, if, they put, if they're put on roads that don't meet the criteria, it becomes very hard for us as TxDOT to convince the general public that you can't have them. And it just, it, it starts to generate, it starts to roll downhill and really snowball. So if you see them put out improperly, bring it up. Bring it up to your traffic department so they can take care of it, please. And now? Overhead speed limit signs. Um, if you notice right there, just smack dab in the middle of the truss. What's it doing there? Well, this will allow the driver an unencumbered view of the speed limit sign so they don't have to look all the way across four to six lanes to see how fast they should be going. The law enforcement like them as a way to say, don't you see the speed limit sign? That makes it easily enforceable. Um, additionally, whoops, did it? Nope, back, wait. Where am I going? Nope. Yep, there we go. Man, I thought I figured that one. Uh, it's easily enforceable. Also, there's a perceived compliance with this large sign. Those drivers that just simply weren't trying to speed but just lost track, lost track of their speed, 
suddenly, oh, wait, I'm, oh, shoot, let me slow down a little bit. Now they're back on track. A couple of signs here. Hey, no trucks, left lane. There it is, 60 miles an hour. It's as large as the truss. 65, as large as the truss. I keep saying that because they're large. They're expensive signs. Um, when we put them in, we're putting them in um, with a freeway lane closure. And again, because we're a metro district, most urban metro districts, we're doing it at nighttime. Well, right. So they also, these signs are not SHSD, MUT, CD compliant. They're not the correct size. They're, they're over large. Not that that's a bad thing. However, we still need the signs on the side of the road, the standard installation per the strip map so they can be enforced. Um, there's another, you know, here they rear their ugly heads again, the justified entitled driver that, you know, you're going to get complaints. They're going to call and they're going to say that they love them, but they're also going to call and say, you need to put them everywhere because people still speed. Well, we, we're not enforcement and we can't put them everywhere because as the MUTCD says, those overhead trusses, we can't overload them with too many messages. Pay attention to how many messages are on your overhead structure so we, we don't bus compliance there. Next. Improve flood gauges. Note that the flood gauge goes to 20 feet and the bridge clearance sign behind it goes to 17 feet. This is needed. Welcome to Houston. Improved flood gauges have a yellow color and they stand out better than the older white color. This is a yellow, as, remember yellow is for warning and white is for regulatory. This consistency can aid in emphasizing the message that you're trying to get out. The Houston District's gauges are larger than the SHSD standards, easier for the public to see, and yes, yes, bigger signs are better. We are in Texas. Don't, uh, they're used with the preceding signs, uh, turn around, don't drown, or road may flood. Um, they have a greater impact on drivers. The turn around, don't drown, I'm a big fan of that one, not just because it sends out the warning message, but it gives the driver something to do. Remember, um, on a serious note, these people are freaking out. They're scared, it's dark, it's raining, it's windy. They don't have um, the higher thinking function to do what they're supposed to do, you give them a warning, well, what do they do with that information? Well, you turn around, you don't drown. That's what's gonna happen. A couple of pictures here. This is not for broadcast, apparently. Um, <laughs> oh, well. Um, road may flood. Well, it did. Uh, <laughs> and if you notice over on the right-hand side, we have um, our flood gauge, which tells us that it's 10 feet. Okay, is it 10 feet where the car is? How is it 10 feet? Is that car floating? No, 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 no. The flood gauge at this point is telling you that underneath the overpass, it's 10 feet deep there, which brings me, here's another one, 11 feet, starts at 11 feet. Well, that can't be right. That's only six inches. That must be 11 inches. They put the wrong thing. No, 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 no. Project the line out, folks. Project the line out and go down. It's 11 feet. If you see water there at the lowest point, it's 11 feet deep. Brings me to some problems. There are a lot of drivers that do not understand these signs. They don't understand what they're trying to convey to them. They just see that it's a flood gauge and they drive past it all the time. Um, I think a little more PSA on our part would be a good thing. Uh, a lot of people think that that you know, foot of water is gonna go downhill as a foot of water and continue as a foot of water uphill. No, 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 it's gonna get to the bottom and fill up like a cup. A lot of people just don't see that. So something we need to, to I think, improve on. Um, they're located to the far right and far left of the road. We try and get them out of the way. So people see them to the far right and the far left, yet during a storm, they're right here. They're not looking to the far right. They're not looking to the far left. They've turned their hazards on. They're driving 10 miles an hour. It's raining like hell. It's dark. And they're not paying attention to signs, and they'll drive right into the water. So something we need to improve on. Flashing curve chevrons. Flashing, uh, please note the solar panel on the top of each one they are lit up, but it's a daytime shot, so 
Anyway, flashing curve chevrons greatly enhance the driver's understanding of the severity of certain curves. They start going into the curve with a little left and then, oh no, a lot left. Uh, they're placed at locations that qualify per the MUTCD. They are loved, yes loved, by local authorities and residences as it reduces the severity and the number of crashes. Uh, we were concerned that there would be a light pollution complaint for these signs. So far we have received no light com pollution complaints at all. And as a matter of fact, those same adjacent property owners have called us to thank us because they're no longer plucking errant vehicles out of their fence or their living room, those kinds of things. Um, and as they're flashing, the signs can help refocus some impaired or fatigued drivers or distracted drivers back onto the roadway. Great wake up, especially at night. And just a few pictures here. We've got, you know, even the advanced warning sign is LED, it's flashing. They go through the curve, they flash you right through the curve. There's one where we actually got a little bit of flash showing. It's easy install. Um, they are expensive to install. So do you need them at every curve? Mm, probably not. Let's, let's think about it. Um, but there is something that has happened. Um, when you go to install them or when a contractor goes to install them, well, they're going to take off the Chevron panels that are out there and they're going to say, you know what, these are perfectly good and they're perfectly spaced Chevrons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick on the battery pack and I'm going to stick on the solar panel and I'm going to stick on these new signs and I'm going to drive off and it rains and they fall straight over. Uh, have your inspectors make sure that they pull the old ones and put the proper um, bases in because they are just a bit heavier than the standard signs. Um, they're more expensive to maintain than just a standard Chevron sign. Obviously, they flash. So you're going to have to get a signal technician. They require special parts. Um, you know, take, it's going to take a little more time to make some repairs. So something you need to, to take a look at. They're also loved so much that people call and, hey, I need them on my curve. I, I need them at the, there, there's not a curve there, ma'am. It's just a slight bend in the road. No, 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 no. It's dangerous and we need this. No, you don't. And I'll convince you. Um, oh, well. Pavement marking improvements. Look at this picture and think, wow, it's white and it's, it's a line. It's marked. It's not very exciting. <laughs> Pavement marking improvements are exciting. They include shadow, contrast, and just wider pavement marking lines, such as uh, six inch lane lines and six inch ed edge lines. Shadow pavement marking is easier to see in bright conditions, such as sunrise or sunset. They're very, um, the black is much less reflective than the striping and even less reflective than asphalt, especially when um, it creates an easily visible line where glare is a serious issue during certain times of day. Contrast pavement marking as a tape product lasts longer and remains effective, um, reflective throughout the product life because all those beads are factory embedded. Wider pavement marking lines are easier to see in adverse weather conditions and in the dark. Oops. And I did it again. Additionally, they're perceived to last longer. There's 50% more product, and so it'll wear longer and it'll look, you'll be able to see the product longer than just the four inch. And there's a nice six inch lane, lane marking. It's beautiful, it's great. Shows up real well. Love it. Here is some contrast pavement marking right next to some new installations. Now if you notice the contrast is significantly older than the new installation of the arrows and the shield. However, it's almost as bright. I mean, it's, it, they really work when they're put down right. Um, nice shadow picture. Y'all have seen it. However, and boy, I'm a breath of fresh air, aren't I? The shadow, <laughs> the contrast, and the wider pavement markings all increase the pavement marking costs on your job. So um, I love them, but it's something to keep in mind. The next thing is uh, removing them, especially the shadow markings. Um, they're difficult to obliterate, and if not done properly, it can confuse drivers, especially if you're just making some small lane shifts to, let's say, add a bike lane or a right lane or a left turn lane. You start cheating, you know, from 12 to 11 and 11. Suddenly there's, there's multiple markings out if they're not removed correctly. Make sure that your inspectors are, are checking that out and removing them correctly. 
Contrast, of course, is a tape product. Tape products are significantly more expensive. And that complicated surface prep, you, you have to have it done and have to have it done correctly or it's coming up and it's coming up quick and it's going to be expensive. And, but wait a minute, the contractor's gonna pay for that. If he messed it up, he's gonna pay. No, 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 we're still paying. Inspectors, uh, closure time, y you name it, we're still in for it. Now, last but not least. Wrong way driving prevention treatments. This is a nice photo of one. Uh, as you can see, the reflective shielding on the poles themselves. Um, increased sign size and some lower sign heights. Okay. Wrong way driving treatment is an attention grabbing treatment for the wrong way driver. Um, it provides additional signing and striping to warn them. It provides a proactive treatment to answer the public concerns. Yet again, you have a concerned caller. Why, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, we're doing something about this issue. Um, wrong way driving treatment provides additional information for the out of state or unfamiliar drivers. These people are lost wandering around wondering who is this guy frontage and why are so many streets named after him? Yeah, a typical risk location is not expensive to install. It's only about $1,000. This gives you great uh, flexibility with installation. You can install a location with some maintenance for forces or you can do like a corridor wide project like we did in the Houston district. Um, because they're subtle changes for the typical driver. They're not confusing at all. Um, they just hardly even notice that they're there. However, there is an installation which is more intrusive in a way. Uh, that is the full Monty, as I call it. And there's a picture of their, we'll, we'll get to it. There, it's, it's a lot more involved than just the subtle lowering of the signs and whatnot. Here's another picture. It, it, it incurs some flashing signs and whatnot. Um, and here's that picture of just the standard the very, it's kind of a low risk area. Um, and what I say by low risk, you're gonna wanna think between the full Monty, which I'm gonna show you, which is about $70,000 and $1,000. You wanna start thinking, do I need to put the full Monty at this location? And this video will show you the full Monty. Um, nice flashing, uh, here's a TxDOT driver and um, he's gonna go the wrong way. He's been, he's been reassigned. Um, <laughs> not too many discipline procedures taken with him. But um, <laughs> it flashes, it sends a message by sensors to our Transtar to let them know that someone got on the wrong way. This is down by Minute Maid Park. Um, we have a lot of out-of-towners there. There are several ramps where people just get confused. They don't. It's an elevated freeway section. It's just strange. But again, this is a $70,000 installation as opposed to a $1,000 installation. Do you need this $70,000 installation everywhere? I don't know. Um, the additional costs and the higher locations, of course, it's a great system, but does it need to be everywhere? You have a lot of people when a crash happens that'll call in and yes, I, you need to put that everywhere. Two weeks later, the dust has settled. It's not on the news anymore. We're putting out $70,000 installations everywhere. What are you doing? You're spending all that money for some turkey that gets on the, the road the wrong way? No. You're, we're not going to win, but hey. Um, <laughs> there are increased maintenance costs, of course, for any of these treatments. Make sure to factor that in. Um, as well as these treatments are fairly new. We're still studying, I believe, TTI was talking about it yesterday. They're still studying the effectiveness of these treatments and hopefully they are doing something. Now, questions? Are you sure? No takers? Y'all don't want to hang around? I, I the... feel that people would like to go home. But really? Uh, if you do want okay. to say, ask a question. If not, you can, they are going to be here tomorrow so you can get their numbers and talk to them privately later if you want to go. What's your question? For using what? He's asking if you've seen any safety benefits for using shields. Uh, we haven't done a study, but yes, there are many people that have called up and they've told us we, we love the shields. I knew exactly where I was going. I needed to be on I-10 going east. I got downtown. 
I had no idea. There's I-10, there's 59, there's 45. Where am I? They saw a shield. It said 10 East. Done. They, they stuck in that lane and just kept on trucking. That person looking at signs and everything could have easily gotten into a crash. So. And I can be negative in this time because the presentation's <laughs> over. Uh, sometimes uh, drivers really start to rely on the shields and people that are commuters when the shield is wearing off go, where's my pavement marking shield? That's my trigger. Dude, you take this road every day. What do you mean you don't know where this, you know, what lane you're supposed to be in? So there is a little bit of that too. So make sure that they're kept up and refreshed, but they do really help. 